welcome and offer you to this space of meditation. As I read the prayer, you don't have to follow along, just be present in the moment. Let us pause and let our souls catch up with that moment. Let us breathe deeply in and out to receive again the breath of life. Let our mind begin to slow, to calm, to quiet, to release the chatter and worry, the planning and control, the questions and the tips, until we become aware of oneness. Let our bodies know the peace of this place and release their tightness. Admit their tiredness, unclench and unfurl in restful trust. Let our spirits lay down their burdens and open to the presence that bids us welcome. 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 Let our hearts unfold layer by layer to reveal the tenderness. Holy One, you dwell in mystery. You are above and beyond all things, yet you come to us in the person of Jesus. In the faces of our loved ones and neighbors, in the gentle embrace of friends, and the company of strangers. You know our burdens, our fears, our hurts, and hopes and happiness. You know our passions, our dreams, our resentments, and our hesitations. And not only ours, but those of each person in our lives. Each member of this community, every nation and ecosystem, and this, your beloved creation. And so we give thanks for all that brings joy and peace, hope and celebration pleasure and amusement, assurance and excitement, to our lives and to the lives of our neighbors. As we offer to you now all that weighs heavy on our hearts, our prayers for ourselves, our loved ones, our community, and our world. God of healing and wholeness, you long for right relationship for all your children and every living thing. We long for that too. To be whole where we are broken. To live in harmony with ourselves, with you, with our neighbors, and with the world. Yet we struggle, for one reason or another, to live out our ideals, to embody your vision. And we find it difficult to move forward when we don't acknowledge the truth of where we are. So we come before you now, trusting in your abiding love, to tell the truth about ourselves, our fears, our failures, our faults, and human nature. God of life-giving compassion, we thank you for assurance, 
that whatever we have done and left undone, however we have fallen short of our own or your hopes for us, nothing can separate us from the love of Jesus Christ. By love, we are graced, reconciled, forgiven, made safe, whole, and free. May our lives reflect our awareness of and gratitude for this truth and all that we do. Thanks be to God. Bow with me. Lord, we're thankful and grateful again for this privilege. We ask now that you would provide strength to your servant. Bless those that would hear your words and may their faith be made stronger. It's in the name of Jesus we do pray. Amen. Let me take the liberty this morning to acknowledge a couple of people who are present with us today. Um, first of all, let me say thanks to Dr. Kelsey and her staff in particular, and who has extended to me this privilege and opportunity uh, to speak at Chapel Law today. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Dr. James E. Peters Jr., who is a contemporary of Dr. Martin Luther King, ministers from the Central Baptist Church join us today as well, in the persons of Reverend Michael Crawford and Reverend Karen Lewis. Uh, we are also thankful for uh, Dr. Jane Witcher, one of my professors, and uh, Dr. Valerie Jackson, my advisor, and certainly to all of my cohorts and colleagues in ministry and uh, fellow students here at Iowa. Let me say on the onset that if there is an elevated expression, it's not a distraction, neither is it a disturbance. It's a part of our tradition. Amen. Uh -huh. And so um, it's okay to have um, to have response. Let me um, let me say uh, let me call your attention to the reading of our text today, Luke chapter twenty-two. I want to read for our hearings verses thirty-nine through forty-six. <clears throat> These words are there recorded. And he came out and went as he was wont to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples also followed him. And when he was at the place, he said unto them, Pray that ye enter not into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them about stones cast, and kneeled down and prayed, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me, Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat was as if were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And when he rose up from prayer and was come to his disciples, he found them sleeping for sorrow, and said unto them, Why sleep ye? Rise and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. A recent trip to Memphis, Tennessee, afforded me the opportunity to visit the historic Mason Temple which is the national headquarters for the Church of God in Christ. It was here that Dr. King gave his final speech, I've been to the mountaintop. He delivered that speech on April 3rd, 1968. He stated, and I quote, well, I don't know what will happen now. We've got some difficult days ahead. But it really doesn't matter with me now, because I've been to the mountaintop. And I don't mind 
like anybody, I would like to live a long life. Longevity has its place. But I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will. And he allowed me to go up to the mountain. And I've looked over and I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. It is reported that Dr. King was not feeling well and had decided to remain at the hotel and allow his good friend, Dr. Ralph Abernathy, to deliver the speech that night. But the temple was packed. Dr. Abernathy called Dr. King and said, these people are here to hear from you. Arrangements were made for Dr. King to make his way to the assembly, and the rest is history. I borrow the words of Dr. King tonight or today to tag this message. I just want to do God's will. The same words were uttered by our Savior in the garden prior to his arrest and ultimately his death. It is ironic that Jesus and Dr. King used these words just hours before they would die. Both at the age or in the thirties of their ages, find themselves having completed the marvelous work that had been ordained and sanctioned to them by God. A divine contract had been agreed upon in the halls of eternity between God the Father and God the Son. The Father knew that the human race would fall short of his expectations and would ultimately lead redemption. The Son agreed to purchase that redemption with his life. At the time of our text, the execution of that contract is being presented. Both Jesus and Dr. King express purpose, pain, and promise in doing the will of God. Jesus understood his purpose. Yes, he gave sight to the blind. He made the lame to walk. He made the dumb to talk. He fed five thousands miraculously. But all of those items were not his purpose. He understood wholeheartedly his purpose was to redeem mankind. He announced on several occasions that the fate of his life had already been predetermined. The opening of chapter 22 announces the threat and the plan to kill Jesus. And even in the face of threat, he does not deter from the purpose that had been laid before him. The Passover that was being celebrated earlier in chapter 22 represented the death of a lamb. However, now Jesus was about to become that life that would save us from the sins of the world. To do God's will, you must clearly understand what your purpose is. Not only does Jesus understand his purpose, but he endures pain. For in doing the will of God, you will experience pain. Jesus, in our text, looks into the cup as he is praying. And while he views in that cup, he sees pain. He sees the cross. He sees his burial. He sees his mistreatment. And he says to his father, I know that the contract term suggests that I must go this way, but if there's any other way to avoid going to hell, if there's any other way to pay for the penalty of sin and death, Father, allow that to be made possible. But ultimately, he says, 
not my will, but thy will be done. For he continued to review the terms of the contract, and in those contracts he saw you and he saw me. He said, I must go to Calvary that I might redeem those that are yet to come. So his pain is expressed to us in verse 44. For he prays more earnestly. He is in agony. His blood drips through the pores of his skin as he prays that we might be redeemed. Not only is his pain for us, but his pain is also for the separation that he and his father would experience. Because they had never been separated in all of eternity. You hear him crying on the cross a few chapters later saying, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? His pain was of such agony that God dispatches an angel from heaven to come down and to minister to him. Let me say to you today that in fulfilling your purpose and you're going to experience pain, go through the pain because God is able to strengthen you for that purpose. Finally, Jesus provides promise. He promises victory for those that engage in doing the will of God. He promises that he will rise again, even though they kill him. He promised that those of us that believe in him should have life and should have life more abundantly. He promised that if I be lifted up from the earth, I'll draw all men unto me. He promised never to leave us nor forsake us. I want to announce that the cause. Jesus is a promise keeper. We shall overcome. Like Jesus, Dr. King knew his purpose. Like Jesus, Dr. King endured pain. Like Jesus, Dr. King presented us with promise. And so I say to you today, my fellow Olympians, when you have finished your requirement, requirements here at Iowa, when you have entered into your call of ministry, Make sure that you are engaged in doing the will of God. You must know your purpose. You must endure the pain. You must promote the promise of Jesus Christ. The words of Dr. King provide for us salutation. And I'm so happy tonight. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man. My eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He's trapping out bitches where the grace of God